Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Pedro Hernandez. I am the Outreach and Engagement Manager for Audubon California, and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our third um, webinar in our four-part webinar series. Um, today, we're be we focus on California coast and climate change. We have a pretty packed agenda. Um, and again, for folks who are joining us for the first time or have joining us uh, for two or all three of our webinars in the series, thank you so much. We're, we hope you enjoy this. Um, again as well and for folks again who are new or maybe have not caught um, the other webinars we have a couple of um, interactive components so for folks on zoom or following on facebook live feel free to drop any um, comments or questions in the chat and we'll do our very best to fit them into our time allotment if not um, we can try to follow up as well too so let me we'll get right into our agenda um, Uh, so again, <laughs> we have a pretty packed agenda. Um, I'll be speaking for about 10 minutes um, I'll, and I'll provide a brief overview of climate impacts. Um, our policy director, Mike Lyons, will discuss our key priori our policy priorities for Advocacy Day. Um, and then we have a pretty solid section on um, three of the leading experts on coastal issues um, concerning birds and habitat in California. Um, we'll be wrapping things up with a question and answer section and discuss some of the next steps for our advocacy day um, plans. So um, we'll jump right into an interactive session um, for about a minute or two. Uh, I'll, we'll open up the chat um, just again for folks to introduce our, uh, ourselves so we can get a sense of what, what area, what chapters we'll come, we're coming from and also um, what climate change impacts are you noticing in your, your home regions? Um, so again, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on this and I will uh, attempt to uh, respond to your questions or, or your comments as they come in uh, in real time. So welcome Janet from Golden Gate Audubon. Uh, Amanda, Amanda from Monterey Audubon, Sea Level Rise. Yes, we'll be we're discussing that definitely today. Um, Jim from San Diego Audubon. Um, let's see, Fran in Sacramento, hello. Um, Jessica, another member from San Diego Audubon. Um, Linda is noticing weather changes. Maureen from Oakland and Golden, Great, uh, Golden Gate Audubon Society. King Tides, um, we actually do have a slide on that today. Um, hot spells in winter and fires. Um, and Becky from uh, Mendocino Coast Audubon. Hello again. Um, I see another Golden Gate Audubon member, high, higher temperatures and fires and sea level rise. Rising waters and flooding. Um, Judy from Benicia. Um, so yeah, so definitely wildfires were, um, and sea level rise are gonna be big uh, challenges going into the future. And hopefully uh, <laughs> through our advocacy, we can help mitigate these issues. Um, but folks who are unfamiliar with Advocacy Day, I'll provide a brief overview where climate change is going to be our, our key area of focus. Um, it's one of the uh, most existential crises we're all, um, facing with, and again, I think this is an issue, um, and we know it's an issue that is affecting multiple sectors of society. Where we're at on our internal um, calendar is we're at the end of our, um, our kind of content webinar series. May 29th, we have a, another webinar where we'll be providing last minute um, policy updates, and June 2nd is our advocacy day um, where we'll be pro, um, facilitating uh, Zoom meetings with your elected officials. Um, as far as the climate change impacts, I'll, I'll spend um, about four or five minutes um, providing a, con uh, a context for our, our presenters. Um, some terminology, adaptation versus mitigation, these are two big um, buzzwords in, in the climate change world. Um, but to really um, simplify them, at least how I explain it to my friends, Adaptation um, is changing either buildings or natural infrastructure to adjust to the impacts of climate change. And mitigation is addressing the underlying causes of, of climate change. So this can be reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this can be energy efficiency measures or carbon sequestration um, from green infrastructure like trees and um, eelgrass, for example. Um, and we know that climate change, um, aside from the many impacts on birds, also has many impacts on 
our own communities as well, ranging from asthma, increased heat mortality. Um, this uh, climate change is also fueling um, international migration um, and also changes in vector ecology, which um, for the last couple of we weeks has definitely been in vogue um, and <laughs> discussing. Um, but more broadly, outside of our um, kind of like human communities, we've, we're seeing larger impacts on agriculture, the transportation sector, um, public health, as I form, uh, mentioned earlier, and also our ecosystems as well. Um, loss of ecosystem biodiversity is one of the um, many um, parallel crises that we're dealing with. And I wanted to make a specific note on that since today is um, uh, Global Biodiversity Day as well too. So <laughs> we'll, um, the intent and one of our goals of, of Audubon's climate advocacy is again to ensure that biodiversity is protected and enhanced to the maximum degree possible. Um, one reason why this is our, our, our emphasis is because Survival by Degrees, which is Audubon's um, 2019 climate um, change impact report, identified that two thirds of all the birds in North America risk um, extinction due to the various impacts of climate change. Um, but on the positive and more um, restorative note, we do know that a significant portion um, of these bird populations can be saved through climate action. And also a significant portion of, um, you know, our human communities can also be saved through climate action as well. Um, and specifically, um, uh, and again, our speakers will, will discuss this much more in detail, um, but climate change impacts specifically to birds include loss of habitat, increased wildfire, um, drought resources, um, or drought limiting water resources, um, sea level rise, which again will be a big um, factor in today's discussion, but also fall springs and heavy rainfall um, due to change in weather and precip precipitation patterns. Um, um, but now that I provided a, a brief overview, um, I'm going to take a, st a second to step back and look at the, uh, the chat questions and comments that have come in, and I'll transition to Mike Lyons, who is our policy director um, for Audubon California. So welcome, thanks, Mike. Thanks, thanks Pedro. Uh, and as I get started, I know some of you have joined us for the last two webinars, uh, but I'm going to touch a bit on our policy priorities that you may have heard me talk about before, because we have many new visitors or attendees to this webinar and on Facebook today. So bear with me for just a few short minutes as I talk about our policy priorities uh, in 2020. And I'll start by just really acknowledging the moment that we're in. Uh, Pedro made reference to the COVID crisis. And when we came into 2020, we had a very different legislative and policy agenda for the state than we do now. Uh, and I'll give you just an example. The state budget had $30 million in it for Department of Fish and Wildlife to increase things like enforcement and land management and conservation and biodiversity practices. Uh, that state budget had a $5.6 billion surplus in it. And we had state reserves for a rainy day fund for the state that was about $20 billion. Now we're looking at a $54 billion deficit to be offset by those, uh, by those reserves to a certain extent. And we're looking at cuts uh, all the way around, uh, including the Department of Fish and Wildlife. That $30 million won't happen this year. And so Audubon is very much focused on identifying where those cuts may be made, trying to defend natural resources. And I'll get into that in a moment. But we also just really acknowledge the human and economic tragedy and, and difficulties that are before us. And we're trying to find uh, where bird conservation and nature and connecting people with nature and protecting policies that allow for that uh, continue to play a role in the public discourse when we're so focused on public health. Next slide. So we still have several uh, pieces of legislation this year that we're tracking, and I'll talk about them in a little more detail in a moment. But one thing I just want to highlight is really that we noticed in the chat when people were loading uh, identifying what they're seeing is the, is the impacts of climate change in their local areas. Again and again, it comes back to these changes in habitat and uh, whether it's the, through climate or wildfires or flooding. And that's changing the way, um, that's changing the way we're trying to manage in birds and protect for birds. We have to think about the habitats now, but also very much in the future. And each of the bills that I'll talk about in just a moment really get at that. 
I mentioned the extreme change in the state budget and we're actively engaged on that front. Uh, also in the budgetary process, both at the state and federal level, of trying to identify the role of natural resources in economic stimulus packages that are moving through Congress and similar discussions here at the state level. Uh, and then lastly, I think we all are very aware that industry, many industries are using this moment to call for economic stimulus, which is valid, but also then saying that they, we should have reduced permitting or environmental review processes. And certainly Audubon is opposed to that. We know we can have an, a thriving economy, kickstart that without doing shortcuts, uh, environmental shortcuts. Next slide. So AB 3030 from Assemblymember Kalra, who was our champion last year on our migratory bird bill that many of you may remember. Uh, he has really stepped up once again and this bill is coming from Defenders of Wildlife, Natural Resources Defense Council, Azul, and Audubon as the co-sponsors. And we are, um, the goal of the bill, uh, really is to set for the goal of the state that by, by, 30, or by 2030, we have 30% of the state's lands and waters under some form of permanent protection. And that includes federal land, state land, voluntary uh, private land uh, interactions like easements, that's not forcing or taking land away from anybody. And it's also making sure that we preserve valu valuable uh, recreational and fishing and hunting opportunities uh, in that process, but to really identify and protect those lands. Next slide. AB, uh, it's actually uh, 2619, is from Assemblymember Stone, which would take money from oil and gas revenues in the, uh, 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 from Thailand revenues, so oil and gas operations that are off the coast, take some of that money every year and put that towards a resiliency fund to improve access and equitable access to the outdoors along the coast, as well as climate resiliency, especially for local jurisdictions who are having to deal with sea level rise, uh, but don't always have the money to plan and prepare for it. This would also include natural infrastructure like soft shorelines, uh, sort of well-fed beaches and estuaries, not just seawalls and that sort of thing. We don't really want to encourage seawalls. So we'll see how this bill will do. Uh, it's difficult, it's a difficult time financially to be asking for taking Thailand revenues to this purpose, but it's a very valid use of that money. And we're going to keep pushing this, whether it's this year or next year, to make sure we set up this kind of fund. Next slide. And lastly, SB 45 is one of the bond instruments for uh, investing in natural resources in the state. Some of you may remember Prop 68 from a few years ago, which was a bond that was primarily focused on state parks, but also put money into other priorities like wetland restoration and salt and sea. Uh, so this bond originally, we came into this very confident that we were going to pass a bond this year. Now with the economic downturn, we're not so sure. And so we'll have to uh, see, but we're continuing to work on this. This bond and other instruments like it at the state level are sort of being recharacterized for economic stimulus. So we're talking about, does restoration bring jobs in? Does it provide other economic benefits? Do things like uh, wetland projects reduce flooding? So with that, I wanna make sure we have enough time for Anna and Andrea. So I'm going to pass off now to Anna Weinstein. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you, uh, Pedro, as well, uh, for that great introduction. So hi, everybody. I'm Anna Weinstein, the Marine Director for Audubon California and National Audubon. Um, really appreciate your being here and sticking with us during this difficult time uh, and showing your commitment to conservation. Um, and if, if you're here, um, uh, like me, uh, who grew up on the Jersey Shore, you appreciate and have a connection to our coast and ocean um, for all it provides you spiritually, physically, what it provides our state economically. And that's reflected in, in the legislation that, um, that we're advocating for in Advocacy Day. Um, and I noticed in the chat, um, there's a lot of my, um, my chapter pals, uh, activist pals here that I've been working with uh, side by side um, for many years on ocean protection and coastal projects. And um, as always, I deeply appreciate and um, will say again um, how critical that, um, that partnership is and your, and your engagement and activism side by side with us, which is what Advocacy Day is about. Um, so you, you know that climate change is uh, changing our uh, and, and impacting negatively our coast and ocean. Um, but I guess I'll say that um, 
we know that our, our the marine species and coastal species um, have a lot of resilience. Some of these species have been around um, some of these birds for 15, 20, 50 million years. Um, other species around for 100 to 500 million years. There's a lot of resilience built in these species and actions that we take to help them and to reverse climate change will make a difference. Um, and I truly believe that. Um, so like this tufted puffin with its sand lance, um, we will, uh, we, will, we will continue to, to look for ways to help these, these types of birds and other wildlife. Next slide, please. So a lot of you already know that we live um, adjacent to our, our ocean is, is, um, is very special. We're one of a few places around the world um, where we have an upwelling process, which uh, it's wind driven. And so when the wind blows, um, nutrient rich water comes up from the surface and drives um, an incredible level of production of tiny animals and plants called phytoplankton and zooplankton. That in turn feeds um, all sorts of uh, forage fish, which then feeds our, um, our marine wildlife. So next slide, please. So what you get is what we like to call a blue Serengeti. Um, and we'll get to the birds, but as, as you all know, uh, this includes whales, uh, like blue whales, and Rizzo's dolphins below with all those uh, social interaction scars all over their bodies. Uh, very cool dolphin. Um, the critically endangered leatherback sea turtle. Um, there's an annual leatherback sea turtle day uh, that Oceana um, got through our legislature a few years ago. And then of course our delicious local and sustainably caught seafood um, that um, is very important to us as Californians. Next slide. Please, thank you. And of course, um, this our productive ocean um, supports um, a, a pretty high diversity of locally breeding seabirds like this rhinoceros auklet with sand lance. Uh, these species, um, we can find them on nesting islands um, in California, all the way from Castle Rock in the north through the Channel Islands um, and um, through Southern California into Baja, Mexico. Next slide, please. Then, of course, oh, that here we, it's another locally breeding species of Cassin's auklet um, here on Anya Nuevo Island, where there's a long term uh, program to monitor their prey, like these anchovy. Next slide, please. Yeah, and so um, in addition to all these locally breeding seabirds that many of us enjoy when we go, when we go to the coast, like uh, the Cassin's auklet, rhinoceros um, auklet, and uh, common myrrh, brown pelican. Uh, we have over 100 visiting species. Uh, many of you will recognize the city Shearwaters here off uh, Santa Cruz Pier in Mon Monterey Bay. So um, this is actually the most numerically uh, abundant um, seabird uh, in California with uh, sometimes tens of millions of birds uh, coming here from uh, flying all the way from, as you see on the map on the, on the left-hand side, those are uh, actually tracking um, paths. So there are telemetry devices put on these birds showing that they fly from the southern hemisphere um, into Japan, Russia, Alaska, and right there uh, on the west coast of the U.S. in our own very, very own backyard, fueling up on our um, super abundant anchovies, sardines, squid. So it just shows that um, all these visiting seabirds, they really rely on our coast and ocean right here off of California to survive and thrive. So we have a special responsibility to these species. Next slide, please. So climate change is um, impacting our ocean in, in a few important ways. Uh, one of them is ocean acidification, which is all the excess carbon that we're producing, um, quite a bit of it. Uh, we think now about 25% of it has gone into the ocean and um, through a chemical reaction um, causes ocean acidification, the lowering of the pH of the ocean, uh, which also um, makes it harder for um, crustaceans and bivalves, uh, sort of the food, the bottom of the food chain, the zooplankton, to create the shells they need to survive. So we are seeing an increase in ocean acidification, um, and we, but we also know that uh, that can be reversed, and we know that local solutions like um, seagrasses and kelp uh, ameliorate local ocean acidification. Another impact is marine heat waves. And so as the ocean absorbs quite a bit of our excess temperatures we're creating, um, as a great favor to all of us, um, we're seeing um, this manifested uh, most harmfully in marine heat waves. 
So this chart shows from the early 80s through around now an increase in the number of, uh, in, of marine heat waves. Most recently, you may recall in the news, uh, warm blobs, uh, they're called warm blobs or masses of warm water off our coast that um, change uh, the availability of forage fish, make them either less, less available or, or less present or just less available, causing seabird die-offs. So seabirds are built to uh, withstand a lot of bad years. Uh, they live a long time. They can skip reproductive years as one of their strategies for a dynamic ocean. But we need to um, reverse climate change in order to have less of these warm blobs. Next slide, please. So I think this is my last slide, and this is kind of a summary. Uh, I'm not sure actually the whole slide is showing there. Maybe it is. Um, I won't read off all of these, but um, for those of you who've been working side by side with me over the years, um, you've worked on all these issues, and together we've had a number of victories to um, achieve marine reserves, protecting forage fish, um, protecting eelgrass and mudflats to support bird life, and ensuring that, um, that seabirds are not incidentally caught on, on fish hooks and we protect our albatrosses uh, while we catch our, um, our local fish. So all of these activities, we always, um, we always select our objectives um, through the lens of climate change. So what activities, uh, what conservation objectives um, are going to help birds through climate change? That, that is a lens we look through all the time. Um, and so each of these activities um, we know do that. And so we'll continue to do these and work uh, with each, many of you uh, on this call um, in coastal chapters and beyond. And um, again, deeply appreciate that partnership. And it's uh, honestly one of the funnest parts of my job is as, as those of you I work with know, to work with uh, chapter staff and chapter members and activists uh, on these issues in many different forums. Um, so I really appreciate your um, participating in Advocacy Day because that's a great example of that. Um, I don't know if I have another slide. Can you advance, please, and, and see? I can't remember. No, I don't. So I'm going to hand it over to Andrea at this point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. It's always a pleasure to hear Anna talk. It's amazing to have a person on our staff with such deep marine expertise. And I'm going to take you more to the nearshore environment and talk about our coastline and particularly our estuaries, which we consider nature's nurseries. Next slide, please. So 80% of Californians live within 30 miles of the coast. That's 32 million people that can have access to our coast or should have access to our coast. And Audubon's working hard to balance the needs of the wildlife that live on the coast, as well as providing access to the people that also want to recreate along our coastline. But there's, there's a lot of competing interests. Next slide. There's also a lot of visitors that come to our coastline, a lot of tourists, not just for Disneyland, but also to go out into the oceans. And as Anna mentioned, to go into these deep seas and go on whale watching trips and see these massive migrations of sooty shearwaters like you see in this picture. Next slide. And Audubon's chosen to focus our work on these estuaries that dot along our coastline. The estuaries are these incredibly rich environments. They're the places where fresh water and sea meets. And it's a place where, as I've said, most of Californians live. Estuaries are incredibly hardworking places. I consider them the hardest working habitats in California. They have to do everything from provide commerce and transportation, provide food, host fisheries, and provide recreational opportunities for people, as well as support all the federally threatened and endangered plants, fish, and birds that live in these environments. So they have to be a lot of things for a lot of different people and a lot of different animals. Next slide. And Audubon focuses our work on estuaries up and down the Pacific Flyway. Um, and that's starting up in Washington and Grays Harbor and Willapa Bay, all the way down to San Diego and Mission Bay that you'll hear a bit about today. We also work internationally to protect estuaries such as Panama Bay, where a lot of our birds spend the winter. And we work on estuaries and the coastline up in Alaska, where a lot of the birds are breeding and, and come down and spend their winters migrating along our coastline in California in particular. Next slide. We've lost a lot of estuary habitat on the Pacific coast of the US. Um, 
starting in Washington all the way down to the Mexican border. We've lost on average about 85%, and this was based on a study that came out from the Pacific Marine Estuary Partnership last year. And so in the middle of California, you can see almost a 92% loss of estuarine habitat, and that includes marshes and uh, tidal lands. Next slide. And why is it so important to protect estuaries? I've mentioned all the services estuaries must provide, and one of the most important habitats in estuaries is eelgrass. I consider eelgrass the foundation of an estuary. And if you don't have a good foundation, your house will crumble. And so if you don't have eelgrass, these estuaries will crum crumble as well. Eelgrass is this hidden underwater seagrass um, that supports so much life. It protects our shoreline by stabilizing it. Um, it helps us ameliorate the impacts of sea level rise. It also sequesters carbon, the blue carbon stored in, blue, uh, in eelgrass. It nurtures and provides fish habitat. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. That includes things that we eat, such as Dungeness crabs and salmon. It feeds birds, including the black brant, which feeds directly on eelgrass, and a lot of other birds that feed in the eelgrass. It improves water quality and absorbs all the nutrients. You can think about all the nutrients coming down the delta from the Central Valley. It helps absorb those nutrients. And it strengthens the coastal economy by supporting vibrant fisheries. Next slide. Where is eelgrass in California? The most of the eelgrass is situated in San Francisco Bay. We've seen a massive loss of eelgrass across the range, but we still have very strong beds in Humboldt Bay, Tomales Bay, San Francisco Bay, and smaller amounts in Mission and San Diego Bay. But about 80% is located in San Francisco Bay. And these are the places Audubon is focusing our work because those are the places we think are the most important to protect from climate change. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, one of the animals very reliant on the eelgrass is the Pacific herring. And Anna has been working with her colleagues to protect those fisheries in California. The, the herring lay their eggs primarily on eelgrass, and that's a primary food resource for a lot of different wintering birds. Next slide. Estuaries have a lot of threats to them, and that comes from everything, what's coming down into the estuary from places like the, the Delta and the Central Valley, the agricultural economy, uh, to marine farming, and that means aquaculture, um, to filling and reclamation. Most of our estuaries are not their former selves. They've been filled and dredged and drained. Um, there's a lot of introduced species in estuaries. There are positive and negative impacts from fishing. And there's a lot of development on our coastline. So as I've mentioned earlier, they're very hardworking and they have a lot of threats, but there's a lot that Audubon can do from both on the ground and a policy perspective. Next slide. So the threats to our estuaries are real and we see them right now. And that's primarily from sea level rise and coastal flooding, um, but also some impacts from ocean acidification as Anna mentioned. So the number of days of coastal flooding in both San Francisco Bay and throughout California keeps increasing. Today, 170,000 people are at risk from coastal flooding. By 2050, that will go up to over 200,000 people. Uh, this picture was taken just last year in the south end of San Francisco Bay where a community flooded. And estuaries are one of the environments where we can help ameliorate that type of flooding and fix some of these places so that there's less flooding in the future. And some of these bills that Mike mentioned are designed just to help with this. Next slide. I wanna, because we're Audubon, I couldn't help myself but mention a few birds that um, really focus on these estuary habitats. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of the key stars of the estuaries. Uh, the first is the Pacific brant that breeds up in Alaska and it winters on our coastline all the way down to Baja, California and Mexico. And they rely almost entirely on eelgrass. And so if you have no eelgrass, you have no brant geese. Uh, next slide. Surf scoter is a bird that breeds up in the boreal forest, but winters in California. It's considered that over 50% of the global population has wintered in San Francisco Bay. And we've lost more than two thirds of that population in the last 10 years. This is one of the birds that feeds in the winter on herring eggs. That's not their only food resource. You see their large bill, they also feed on 
a lot of um, bivalves, but they do feed on herring eggs. So they're, they're very tied to the herring migration. Um, and so that's one of the birds we've seen pretty massive declines in California. Next slide. Shorebirds, migratory shorebirds like the least sandpiper in this picture, they come into estuaries and feed on a very rich environment. These are birds that are coming out of Alaska where they're breeding. Uh, least sandpipers breed on the front range of Alaska and they migrate through California. Some spend the winter and some go further to places like Panama Bay, but they're picking off the rich invertebrate resources in these nutrient rich waters and estuaries. Next slide. We also have rare and endangered species in estuaries. One of the most endangered is the Ridgeways rail, and there are three subspecies in California, and they're all federally endangered. And this is the Ridgeways rail in San Francisco Bay. Um, and they breed in the marshes, the tidal marshes, particularly the pickleweed marshes within the bays. And they, they've endangered because they've lost so much of their habitat. There's so little marshland left in any of these bays in California. But a lot of people are trying to protect these birds. Next slide. And I can't help but mention the snowy plover. A lot of the snowy plovers breed at the mouths of estuaries because that's where a lot of the rich food resources are. They do breed up and down our coastline as well. Um, and if you're uh, in Audubon California's action alerts, we just put out an action alert today to protect birds at Oceano Dunes. So we hope you'll respond to that. And this is a federally threatened species on the Pacific coast. Next slide. And I just wanna mention two projects Audubon's engaged with, one that Audubon California is engaged with and one that our partner San Diego Audubon is engaged with. And I'll turn the slides over to Andrew. In San Francisco Bay, Audubon has been involved with a restoration project in partnership with San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge for the past eight years. And we've been testing how to fix a marsh um, so that it drains better and so that it provides high tide habitat for birds um, as we get more sea level rise impacts. It's been a really groundbreaking study where we've learned how to rebuild a marsh, make it more adaptive to climate change in the future and support birds and wildlife in the future. It's also caused policy to change in San Francisco Bay so that more people can do these kinds of restoration projects that have lasting benefits for birds and other wildlife. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to the Conservation Director for San Diego Audubon, Andrew Meyer. Hi, uh, thanks very much, Andrea. Uh, and thanks very much, Anna and Mike and Pedro uh, for this opportunity. Uh, so the down here in San Diego, in this corner of California, We've been working on a project called Rewild Mission Bay, and it ties into and stems off of and is here because of a lot of the work that Anna and Andrea were talking about that Audubon California has been leading with for decades. So uh, it's very much uh, affected by many of the issues that, that were brought up and responding to many of the climate change impacts and many of the bird species. Uh, Andrea definitely has cuter pictures than I do of birds, so I'll apologize right, right here up front. Uh, that there's not a lot of cute bird fo photos in this, uh, in this webinar, uh, in my, my slides at least. Uh, but the Rewild Mission Bay project is a, a, specific, uh, a specific project. It's a wetland restoration project looking at Mission Bay, which is down here in, in San Diego. So it's a, a local example of some of the issues, like I said, and project, uh, problems and, uh, and, and possibilities for um, uh, estuaries and tidal wetland habitat in uh, along the coast of, of California. And it's a project that started by the San Diego Audubon Society with a lot of help from Audubon California, like I mentioned, and with a lot of help and leadership from uh, Rebecca Schwartz-Lesberg, who was my predecessor and now works at Audubon California. So a lot of, a lot of community support, a lot of um, Audubon California and a lot of local staff have been pouring their heart and souls into this project uh, for, for a while. Uh, next slide, Pedro. Thanks, so, so I think it's pretty helpful to start with the bird's eye view, and that's the only bird joke that I'll have in my presentation. But this bird's eye view is really, really helpful. It very much illustrates some of the things that Andrea was just talking about, about the changes in our coastal ecosystems, our estuarine environments, 
So this is, if you're familiar with San Diego, this is Mission Bay, it used to be called False Bay. Um, the, the, you can see in the 1937 photo, there's some roads here, there's a little bit of development. Um, it's along the coast, just there on the farthest left side of, of the photo. That's, the, that's where the Pacific Ocean starts. So this is Mission Bay and Pacific Beach uh, um, and, and Mission Beach and, and Ocean Beach down here. You can see a huge mudflat environment of the San Diego River coming into the, into the, the dark swirling masses of, the, um, of Mission Bay. And it's a vibrant mudflat, rich, rich in mudflat, rich in tidal wetland habitat um, up uh, through in this 1937 photo with, with some development along the shoreline for sure and, and a causeway going right through the middle of the marsh there. If you move into the late 40s, 40s and 50s, we started to do a, a whole lot of earth moving in Mission Bay. And again, this is the story of lots of, you're probably thinking of your own estuarine environment close to you, the own, the, your own bay and your own um, lagoon environment near you. And this is a story that's been repeated up and down the coast. Uh, so here in the 1940s, the mid 40s, late 40s, on into the 50s, there was a lot of earth moving, a lot of dredging in order to make it uh, recreation boating friendly so that the water is a lot deeper now and the shoreline is a lot more defined. So there are a lot of places where people can put boats into the water, sandy beaches increased dramatically, and the shores were hardened where they weren't made into sand so that we could have development right up to the shores of Mission Bay and, uh, and stop the shoreline and the dune habitat mo moving around as it used to. So on into the 40s and then on into 2019, my slide is now a year, a year old, I should update that. But on, at 2019 here, you can see there's a whole lot of island habitat, there's a whole lot of deep water habitat, like I mentioned, and there's a whole lot of recreational focus to Mission Bay. Uh, and the recreational focus is, is great in a lot of ways. I, my daughter had her birthday party along the shore here. I've been to six or seven little kids' birthday parties here. So it's used by 15 million visitors annually. It's a big draw for San Diego, and it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's definitely home to lots of the bird species that Andrew was talking about, we have Brant uh, moving through, we're on the Pacific Flyway, so a lot of migratory birds move in and out of this area uh, and, some, and many of them stay. Um, in the northeast corner of the, of the bay, there is a little remnant marsh, the Kendall Frost Marsh, which is uh, owned and maintained by University of California, San Diego. So you can see there's a little bit of fuzziness there where there is not a, a straight obvious line between the bay and the development and that little smudge there is the last remaining tidal wetland habitat in Mission Bay. All the rest of it has been moved around and, and um, dredged into islands and dredged into deeper water. So it very, very clearly shows you over the course of not too long, this is 75 years or so, how much we've changed the habitats. Um, and, and, and in this case, focused it towards recreation. It's, it's billed as one of the largest aquatic recreation parks in the, in the US. Next slide. If we step back beyond 75 years, beyond 100 years, um, this is a, is a map, but it's, it's neat how clear it is in terms of an air photo, how clear it is for the, the shoreline and the habitats that were there and, and what it looked like. This is from 1857, to, like I said, a, a hand-drawn map, but it gives you an idea of how humans were interacting with the bay for thousands of years for, with our Native American populations with many vibrant communities living along the shores of, of False Bay. Uh, uh, it was called False Bay by the Spanish when they arrived, but it was called something else before that. And it was used by humans for thousands of years in, its, in this form as a, as a giant mudflat marsh with a lot of tidal wetland habitat and a lot of coastal sand dune habitat. <clears throat> you can see some of, the, um, some of the estuarine environments for sure and some of the floodplain floodplain environment where, the, where streams and rivers are coming into False Bay. And you get an idea of how much it's changed from now in those last photos to what it was like uh, 100 years ago. And, and it had been used and uh, natural resources were pulled from it and interacted with by humans for thousands of years. And only in the last 75 years or so has it been greatly modified to the detriment of habitat in a lot of ways. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> Uh, 1949, I, I love this uh, little image of the uh, uh, recreation focus, the, the tourist book from 1949 here. This is what, it doesn't look exactly like this, but in the late 40s, this is what, they, what the uh, tourist map looked like for the area. And you can see, uh, just, again, just driving home the point that this area, the, the natural resources were secondary to the recreation value 
of this area as, as we started moving things around after World War II. Um, and it looks like a lot of fun, uh, Fiesta Bahia. Um, it doesn't look like this exactly anymore, like I said, and pretty soon after we started moving land around and, and making it a recreation focused, a lot of focus, a lot of people, uh, Audubon included, San Diego Audubon, um, with help from Audubon, California, certainly, started thinking about and started emphasizing, well, what have we lost with this change in focus from, from this mudflat and tidal wetland uh, lagoon and estuarine environment to a, a more deep water and sandy shoreline environment focused on, on recreation. And some of the species here at the bottom are just a few of the ones that we've been highlighting in the last uh, 10 years or so through the Rewild Mission Bay project. On the left is the uh, uh, endangered California least tern. That's uh, one of the first species on the endangered species list. It's our smallest least tern. It's really cute. It's just about this big. It's in your hands. Um, and it needs coastal dune habitat to, to nest and to feed its young and to survive on, uh, uh, in its um, wintering uh, location. And then it migrates back down to the coast of Pacific coast off of Central and Southern uh, America. Uh, the, in the middle there is one of the native plants that we have that is also endangered, that's Nuttall's Lotus. And on the left there is the Ridgeways Rail, which for me is very difficult to say, uh, Ridgeways Rail. Um, but, but it's, uh, um, Andrea had a picture of it with um, some of its really dark colored um, uh, young, its offspring, it's a little cuter than the photo that I have. But that species in particular, and again, this kind of brings this Rewild Mission Bay project up to the rest of the coast and to the rest of the uh, sh rest of the shores around the world in which we have a lot of people living along the environment, wanting to share the same space with these, with many um, uh, vibrant ecosystems and, and birds in particular. Ridgeways rails along the entire California coast have lost a lot of their habitat through earth moving uh, um, endeavors, just like is illustrated here in Mission Bay. So that's one of the species that we're definitely focusing on for the Rewild Mission Bay project. It lives in the Kendall Frost Marsh in that uh, um, tidal wetland habitat that's the last remnant piece of Mission Bay. Uh, there are population there that's surviving, but it obviously used to have a lot more habitat available and, um, and be a lot more common in here as well as in some of the other places in the San Diego River and Tijuana uh, uh, Estuarine Research Area down here. Um, most of those populations are not doing very well, including the Kendall Frost uh, population. Next slide. Pedro? Thanks. So, so about uh, 2014, about six years ago, seven years ago, uh, San Diego Audubon Society got a grant from the Coastal Conservancy, the California Coastal Conservancy, the State Coastal Conservancy, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So it was a state and federal money. We were lucky enough to get it. Um, and uh, uh, it is a project that we've been doing from 2014 through 2019, uh, through 2018. Uh, was to create this feasibility study, which is here on the right. Um, and it, I think one of the main reasons that we had such a compelling argument for the grant, and certainly one of the compelling reasons that we think this is a worthwhile project, is that it very clearly builds off of the Mission Bay Park master plan. So this idea of wetland restoration, the idea of making sure our natural resources are maintained and improved, even in this uh, recreational focused area, is something that the community has been hitting over and over again any chance they get uh, and the master plan from the 90s is one of the great documents that em emphasizes that and lays it out for 25 years that master plan existed without much uh, without much movement towards wetland restoration so we had a pretty compelling argument and we we still do that we uh, the community has been calling for wetland restoration here let's do a feasibility study to get some ideas and, and show some scientific evidence about what's possible and how humans, as well as all of the other organisms we share our, these estuarine environments with can benefit. So multiple community meetings, that feasibility study is, is out now. We finished it at the end of 2018, so about a year and a bit ago. Uh, that feasibility study definitely was able, was very helpful for us to hit some of the options and some of the uh, benefits that we would receive and we are using those benefits and those options as we talk to the city and as we talk to other community groups in the area to try and get the uh, a lot substantial wetland restoration project to be the direction that the city chooses. Um, okay, next slide, please. And so here's a study area. I won't spend too much time on this, but if you know the area, it's the northeast corner of Mission Bay. Uh, next slide, Pedro, please. Uh, and long story short, this is the one that we are now advocating for. This is the wildest wetland alternative 
And it looks to, and it's shown that it's feasible to restore a lot of wetland in the northeast corner of Mission Bay. This is a small piece of, of the whole Mission Bay. So a lot of Mission Bay will retain its focus on, on sand and, and recreational habitat, uh, recreational areas. But this corner where Rose Creek flows in and where we have that existing uh, um, tidal wetland habitat is the best spot for wetland restoration in all of Mission Bay and one of the best spots in San Diego. Next slide. And I'll hit on just this one. There's a lot of information in this feasibility study, obviously, but I'll, I'll emphasize this one. Well, could you go back, go back one for just a sec? Yeah, this one is um, uh, just, we provided some information through this feasibility study that wasn't there before. So sea level rise is a critical piece of what we feel and, and lots of groups feel that uh, the city should be planning for in this area. Sea level rise will obviously impact whatever uh, um, recreational focused things that we have here, as well as whatever uh, uh, tidal wetland habitat we have here. So the largest wetland restoration uh, at the top of this graph, you can get an idea of how much these tidal wetland habitats will be helpful in protecting our coastline, but will also need a large, lot of investment right here up front if we wanna see any of these habitats remain as they bump up against our existing development. Okay, next slide. So we had a lot of partners working on this. We definitely didn't do this by ourselves. I won't go through all of these, but we, had, uh, we put together a great group of folks to help input on the feasibility and technical piece of it, as well as kind of steer the project along and complete the scientific pieces of the, of the feasibility study. Next slide. We had some funding from the Coastal Conservancy and the Fish and Wildlife Service, like I mentioned, uh, and we've had subsequent funny funding from the Resources Legacy Fund in order to share the information. And next slide. Uh, the last thing I'll say here is that we've been putting together a coalition of groups. Again, this is kind of touching on the, um, the support that we need in order to say that a substantial wetland restoration project is what, what uh, the community wants here. We've been building a coalition of groups that also are, are saying, yes, this feasibility study is pointing to the right way that the city should go. We've thought about a lot of the options. Uh, we thought about water quality impacts. We, we talk about sea level rise a lot. We talk about access to our shoreline. And we definitely talk about natural resource uh, benefits and habitat benefits. So next slide, I think, is my last one, Pedro. Um, the Wetland Restoration Project, the, this Rewild Mission Bay project, I feel really lucky and eternally grateful that we get a chance to talk to the community about a really proactive and positive project. Um, Anna and Andrea mentioned the climate, the carbon sequestration value of a tidal wetland. We get to talk with community groups and with, you know, with people from high schools, which we're seeing here during the global climate walkout, we get to talk to uh, rotary clubs and environmental organizations and labor groups and religious organizations um, about a project that is not only at adapting to, to sea level rise and, and climate change by, by increasing the resilience of our shoreline, but also mitigating a little bit of the, the climate crisis. Uh, uh, tidal wetland is a great sequester of carbon so this project kind of brings together a lot of positive things. And it's one of the ways that the city of San Diego, as well as the state of California can get behind some projects that are really, um, really positive and, and kind of steer away from, we understand what climate change is doing. We know that there's gonna be a lot of things and, and Anna mentioned this, but there's also lots of positive projects that we can do to help um, right the ship and, and, and increase the value of habitat for birds and other, other wildlife. So thanks very much. Oh, and yeah, next slide actually is also mine. I just wanted to say, this is a picture from our, um, our uh, local fisheries and, and uh, marine fisheries group that's been championing it. Uh, that's one of our, our staff there, Megan Flaherty, is our restoration program manager and a bunch of the uh, friends that she's made, um, uh, volunteer activists that have come with, to many of the Coastal Commission and Pacific Marine Fishery Council meetings talking about uh, the fisheries things that uh, fisheries uh, advocacy uh, projects that Anna was mentioning at the beginning. This rewild project is just one of the ways that we're getting involved here locally. Another way is the fisheries um, uh, projects that, that Megan's work been working on. But here's a list of some of the things that I'm sure that you, many of these things you're probably already doing, probably already would love to get involved with. Um, but there's a, a good mix of things, long-term things that we've been talking about so far, as well as short-term everyday and very local things that we can do in order to combat the climate crisis and stay positive and find some, some um, um, uh, things that we can grab onto. And part of those is teaching and advocating and joining networks, which we're certainly doing down here with a lot of help from Audubon, California. So thank you. I'll pass it back over to Anna Weinstein.
All right, folks. Um, thanks so much, Andrew. That it's an amazing project. Um, love hearing about it. So just super quickly. Um, so what can you do for Adv Advocacy Day? So pretty straightforward for Adv Advocacy Day. Um, ask legislators uh, to support AB 3030 to protect 30% of um, habitats. And Mike uh, provided detail on that earlier. Um, ask legislators to support AB 2619 to help economic recovery and our coasts through uh, completing coastal adaptation projects. Um, and finally, uh, related to SB 45, the bond that we've been supporting, past economic stimulus or bond, um, support coastal infrastructure projects as part of economic stimulus. So weaving uh, our coast and ocean and adaptation um, into economic recovery that's in front of us. Well, hi everyone. Um, I don't. I'm not sure what's happened to the presentation, but um, and I think we've lost it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> that was totally. Um, I I I I clicked the button twice, and it was a delay. Um, but yeah, we're we're gonna open things up to um, the question and answer section. So we have a couple more minutes. Um, I will. Um, just do a quick plug, if folks um, have not registered for Advocacy Day yet, um, we'll be dropping the chat in um, within the next couple of minutes. Um, again, just in case you're not registered, but we'll have the rest of our time um, for a Q&A section for all of our great panelists here. So again, thank you all for, um, uh, for, for joining us. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in um, the chat. Uh, someone mentioned that there's a lot of possibility for East San Francisco Bay. Um, I would agree there are some um, significant eelgrass beds on the east side of San Francisco Bay, uh, Richmond shoreline, um, San Leandro shoreline. Um, Anna's noticed a lot of um, herring runs around the Richmond Bay area and there's also San Pablo Bay going further north. Um, and so we're going to be starting to do um, some research to look at where some of these best places are to re restore eelgrass in San Francisco Bay that incorporate the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. Awesome. Thank you, um, Andrea. And for Andrew, I see a question. Um, how did you outreach to the community groups to get them involved in this project? Um, we do that. Oh, oh, that's for Andrew. Sorry. For Andrew, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I can, I'm sure there's a lot I can learn from Andrea anyway. Uh, but uh, like I said, it was, this project is, uh, predates me. I've only been at San Diego Audubon Society for about two years. So, so I'm standing on the shoulders of giants for sure. But a lot of the staff time and a lot of the kind of um, leaders that we've had in this project have been involved. The, the feasibility study itself had more than six community meetings in order to put together a bunch of ideas from the public and then send it back to the engineers and the technical team and then bring it back to the public back and forth. So there was a lot of within the, the results or within the feasibility study itself, there was a lot of community input and a lot of discussions. Um, once the feasibility study is done and now we're advocating for one, one of the, uh, the wildest option, the, the substantial wetland restoration, we've been talking to community groups and building a coalition slowly. We just had two more groups join this, this past week, which is great. So we've got to figure out how to change all the logos and uh, fit more logos on there. But um, it's a, I would say uh, that it's a very compelling and, and most of, mostly pretty easy sell. We're talking about habitat restoration, but we're also talking about a project that has water quality benefits for all the users of Mission Bay. We're talking about resilience to sea level rise. We're talking about improved access for all people in San Diego. So we definitely tailor the message a bit because there's lots of benefits. We don't just talk about bird habitat. Uh, we talk about uh, how, how this park can be beneficial, how this public land can be beneficial to, um, to people throughout San Diego and people all along the coast. So um, it's, it's an argument that really is easy to make in most cases. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I see a question. Um, 
I think would be fit for Mike. Um, just uh, an update on, I think the question was, where were we at with the gutting of the Migratory Bird Treaty? And I know you had discussed this a little bit um, earlier. Uh, sure. So uh, th because that's, I want to focus on the coast today, so I will let folks follow up with me individually to talk about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. But at the federal level, the Trump administration has issued its final rule uh, to repeal incidental take protection for migratory birds. So basically when they're killed, but um, not on purpose. But because of Assembly Member Kalra and members like you guys last year on our advocacy day, California passed legislation to continue to provide that protection to birds, even if the federal government pulls it back. So our birds in California should be protected as they always have been. Uh, and we're working at the federal level to undo the Trump administration's, uh, frankly, mistaken rule. And that may even result in litigation. So we'll see. Uh, but I want to go back and refocus on the coastal stuff if we can. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been seeing a couple of just different comments about eelgrass. Seems like a very uh, popular subject. Um, I guess, is there anything else um, about its importance or maybe some tips of how our Audubon network can talk to regular people or their friends about eelgrass? Anna, do you want to go for this? Yeah, I love that question. Thank you, whoever asked it. And um, that, that really, I, I love that question because um, eelgrass is not something we see, but it provides so many ecosystem services for our birds and wildlife. Um, and we're developing right now some uh, communications materials. Um, in fact, that slide that Andrea, that great slide, um, where the brant goose in the middle and all the ecosystem services, that's something we can provide to you. Um, so if you contact us, we can provide materials. And then there's like, uh, there's, and that slide has six, um, six ways eelgrass is important. Um, and so if you uh, live on the coast and uh, you're tracking coastal issues and coastal development, um, you can look at project applications and see if they involve eelgrass. There's different ways you personally can engage in eelgrass. But I really invite you to contact Andrea or me to ask more specific questions because we are pretty deep in that. Um, and we're both eelgrass fanatics, as I'm sure Andrew is too. So, um, so please contact us. Awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it was one. Of, I learned so much about eelgrass just working in the couple of months already. I've I've been in Audubon, California. So it's it's been tremendously interesting, at least personally. Um, and you know, on on that note, I hope this uh, webinar series has been uh interesting as well for for all all, all of y'all who have been joining us um, a quick note we will be um ensuring that all of our webinar series up to this date um uh, are going to be posted on our facebook um page at audubon california and also our youtube page as well too in case um, any of the ch uh, chapters would like to circulate um this amongst your networks or watch again on a saturday evening if you really really want to um, and on, on that note, again, if, if y'all um, want to learn more about Advocacy Day, you can uh, visit our website at Audubon California again. Um, and we are looking very forward to um, contacting all the folks who have joined um, and registered for Aud uh, Audubon's uh, 2020 Advocacy Day. Um, so keep an eye out for an email from an Audubon staffer. Um, and again, we'll be and try to support you um, along the way as well. So thank you all for attending. We look forward to, um, you know, increased advocacy, um, not only on June 2nd, but beyond, and again, a healthy planet for communities and birds. So thank you all again. Feel free to reach out for any questions or concerns. Have a good e uh, evening and weekend, three-day weekend. <laughs>